Frozen Stupid is a unconditional love story. Uh, it's set on a frozen lake uh, with this family, mainly the father and his son. Uh, both are kind of playing hooky from their life and uh, go out on the ice and get into all sorts of trouble. And uh, this is not something new to them. This is something that they've done time and time again, so uh, their families are used to this kind of behavior. This particular weekend, though, things start to go really bad for them. Uh, however, in the end, it still works out, and uh, they completely redeem themselves. Tony is, oh, kind of an everyman. I mean, he's just a regular guy, teaches school, and his real joy in life, his passion is to go out and recreate on the weekends. Guess where he got me this time? Out in the middle of nowhere in the cold at Houghton Lake <laughs> in Michigan, of all places. Stormy is a fisherwoman. She's a bit of a conundrum because she is totally boy in many of the things that she does, but yet she's in this very feminine body with, you know, her French manicure and her curls. And um, But at the same time, she loves trucks and snowmobiles and getting her hands dirty fishing. I have never ice fished, but I grew up fishing in Oklahoma, so this is something that I could definitely relate to as far as getting out there and, and going fishing for an entire day and being focused and, and really wanting to throw yourself into it. In the face of huge trouble, they continue an optimism that is amazing. Now, when things start going bad for these guys, it's like, well, it's not that bad. We can just, we'll just keep going. And so they jump to the next level and something else goes bad and even worse. And they still adopt this attitude that, well, you know, I can, uh, I can get through that. That's fine. It's not a big deal. We'll, we'll just keep going. So they just jump to the next level and, and et cetera, et cetera. And, it, and that is an amazing process to watch. And I thought that'd be a fun thing to include in this movie. And that's kind of what this movie's about. I worked with Rich on Escanaba in the Moonlight, uh, Purple Rose Films with Jeff Daniels. Rich was the director of photography on that shoot. We just kind of got to, you know, chatting and talking, and I found out he made some films too, and, and you know, little by little, with uh, in a very, very relaxed way, we've kind of come together for a couple different ones now. I go fishing in Alaska, but in the summertime. Uh, other than that, uh, I just, uh, I, I didn't know about ice fishing, except that I'd read about it, or what I saw on television, and that was about it. Hey, what are you doing here, Pop? What do you mean, what am I doing here? What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be at a birthday party? It's not till two. <laughs> it's only half past ten. I got tons of time. Well, actually, the party's at four. There you go. Better yet. <laughs> Today has been exceptionally hot. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, I'm, I'm overbundled right now, I think. I'm coming in down with a sweat. <laughs> You're the man. Thank you. Okay, buddy. Don't get cold. Yeah, <laughs> oh, no way. Put your jacket no, on. I'm, I'm toasty up now. Thank you. Ernie Borgnine, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was writing the screenplay, I actually was envisioning guys like Ernest Borgnine playing this part. So halfway through the screenplay, I called Ernie and, and asked him if he'd be interested in playing this part. And he laughed and he said, you know, I'd love to. It sounds great. So that was it allowed me to lock him into that character. And so it was, it was easier to write the rest of the movie because I knew who was going to be uh, delivering lines and how they act and all that, so it worked out good. Same with everybody else on this cast. Uh, I've worked with all these people before. We had 15 Screen Actors Guild actors on this thing, starting with Academy Award winner Ernie Borgnine uh, all the way down. Uh, I was able to catch everybody at home early one morning. You got to wake these actors up in the morning if they're if they're at home, and I was able to go through the whole list pretty much in one hour. Well, he called me up and said, I've got another project in the works and I've got this, this role that I think you'd have a lot of fun with and it's this uh, kind of rugged fisherwoman and it just, it sounded really interesting because I really hadn't played anything like Stormy. He gave me a call and said, oh, I really been thinking about you as I'm writing this and been thinking about you as I read this and I want you to play Tony Norgard and I had no idea it was, you know, the size of the role that it was, but I thought, well, sure, if Rich wants me to do it, I'll come and do it. I love the work, and I like working with Rich, so it was kind of a no-brainer. A couple weeks later, I found out it was going to be a sizable amount of work, which is great. Rich Brower is the easiest and nicest fellow I've ever known. He's the kind of fellow that um, we should have more and more and more of in picture making, believe me. 
because nothing seems to bother him. He just keeps going and, hey, it'll be fixed, don't worry, we'll do it, and um, bam, it gets done. So he, he came uh, in, in on it early and he said, hey, the only ice I, will, I like is in my uh, uh, gin and tonics. And, uh, so, and I don't think he was really kidding, but when he got here, this lake was frozen solid, you know, a foot and a half deep with ice, and uh, it was chilly out there. And the casting crew uh, had their hands full dealing with cold, um, but it could have been a lot worse. I, I personally think we got off easy. Uh, we were in sort of a lull in the middle of the winter, and the, the temperatures did not get below zero, and so they were, they were above that, which is a little easier to work in, and some days the sun came out. You guys look like you're wanted for something. Let's hurry up and do this before they catch up with you. Oh, we're wanted all. <laughs> I'm such a fan of Joey Albright, and any time the camera is on him, it just, you know, he lights up the screen. So to be able to actually work with him, and then he really helped me. I had some ideas about Stormy. Rich had written a really great and colorful character, and the great thing about Rich Brower is that he allows, you know, actors to really take an idea and run with it, and then he lets Storm, you, Stormy, you know, know where it's too far, and that's just fun, you know, for an actor. Ernest Borgnine, what a dream for me. I, uh, I don't know, I got to have breakfast with him every day for a week, met up in his suite, ran lines, listened to stories, got advice. It was priceless. He was wonderful, very gracious man, loves life. And I want to tell you, I'm almost thinking of becoming a Michigander myself. The man is an Academy Award winner and a Golden Globe winner and um, has, I believe he said this was his 188th project that he's worked on. So you get all that experience as an actor, but also you get Ernest Borgnine the man. And so that helps you in between takes because Ernie is constantly giving and he's so generous with, with his talent and generous with his spirit. So, you know, you're having as much fun when they yell cut and you're hanging out at craft service, you know, hearing his incredible stories about Betty Davis or about working with Frank Sinatra. Everyone on this crew has been so cool and everyone who's come in has been so much fun. And it's one of those atmospheres where you feel like you want to do your best because of all of them. I feel like we all, everybody's, uh, everybody worked harder or everybody worked more efficiently. I really felt like it was a, a really good team atmosphere and that we were there and the preparation wasn't just because, oh, I want to look good or, oh, because I don't want to mess up. It was there because we wanted to be there and be good for each other. Kim Guerrero is awesome. She and I had so much fun together, and I really feel like, and I, I hesitate to say this because if you watch it, maybe you'll disagree with me, but nothing ever felt invented. Nothing ever felt like, oh, this is a great bit, this will be funny, let's do this. And not that I have anything against that, but I just assume things come from a real, a natural, an organic place. And with her, she, I always felt like we were on the same page with that. And so as much fun as we had, and as many different little things that we ended up fitting into the scenes, I never felt like the scene stopped so we could do a bit. I always felt like it was a natural part of the flow of the scene. We've had a tremendous shoot here. I think, I think it's just been one day of fun after another, and uh, that's what movie making is all about. Anytime you're ready, sir. Ernie enjoyed starting the day by uh, teasing the crew. He would come on set and he'd see me over there and he goes, Mr. Director, the actors are ready. <laughs> and I'd be setting up something and it's like, okay, uh, and I'd just been with him two minutes earlier with a, on a rehearsal. And uh, so I go, hey, another like five minutes. <laughs> and he'd sit down, hurry up, I'm forgetting my lines. I love her a lot of times, we only took one take of something. And uh, I, I've been told by people in this industry that, uh, you know, if you actually take one take and it's perfect, and you, and you move on, what that does is sends a signal to everybody that if everybody gives it their all, that you respect that and you'll move on. And I've taken that to heart. And, you know, you hope later that, geez, you know, I hope I didn't, you know, jump to conclusions on that. He just keeps it moving, which keeps a, a certain sense of urgency, and uh, it's nice. You don't get bored. Nothing is superfluous, and everything is done for a reason, and it's just, it moves. It just moves, and I like that energy. Either you do it, or I do it. I was constantly surprised that every time uh, Holly yelled action, 
that I didn't know, I really didn't know what was going to happen. He, he's an actor's dream because he allows you to really have fun and create and be silly and um, but yet he has that perfect balance of having a vision and knowing what he really wants to do and, and, and making it happen and he has a he has a unique ability of bringing together very cool people that are not only talented but they're fun to hang out with and, and really you know create that family atmosphere. Another thing that got me excited about Houghton Lake was when I was a kid my dad always went to Houghton Lake and uh, took part of this whole festival business and he'd come back with all these different stories and uh, most of them were far-fetched and slightly unbelievable. Hey, look who's Tony. here. <laughs> what are you doing here, Pop? You missed the party. Is it that late already? <laughs> What's with all this, ooh, can't wait to see how you're going to wiggle your way out of this one stuff. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> I went there just before winter to the community to ask them if they wanted a movie company to show up and kind of feature their town. There were 12 people sitting around this table, from the Chamber of Commerce to the tourism people to the hotel motel folks, uh, this, that, and everything else. And they were there just grinning at the whole notion that we would uh, honor them in a way, they felt, by, by using their location. And so I came away from, their, from that meeting thinking I would be an idiot if I didn't keep this thing moving and use this great energy that's been started here. So a month later I threw the switch and we got into production. <laughs> Houghton Lake is a very unique pocket of uh, uh, Americana. They're extremely resourceful people, and uh, it's sort of buried in a, in a kind of a rural area, so they're not very close to uh, bigger metro kinds of uh, distractions, so they become very creative. Uh, ice fishing is a big part of their community, and but they also have just a lot of fun. These people are very fun people to, to be with. This movie would not have been able to have been done without the support of a community. And I've pledged a long time ago to not just barge into a community and uh, with some arrogance of any kind and think that we're going to, you know, solve all the world's problems. That is so ridiculous, and I've seen com film companies do that, and it's wrong. So we've uh, we've adopted the attitude where we really want to be invited in and make sure that that they're they got an investment with us in terms of emotion and and uh, other things, and we never let them down. We we try to leave them with more than we came with. Hot dog juice. <laughs> On the fourth floor of this hotel, they offered us the conference room. And it had uh, 10 foot ceilings, but it was in the same building that we were all living. And it was about 50 feet from where Ernie's uh, penthouse suite was. So he didn't even have to get out of, his, uh, out of the building to go to the set. He would walk out in his pajamas almost and he'd be ready to go. We built a set, uh, it was 20 by 24 foot risers. We had a 600 gallon aquarium built underneath the actual shanty part. And uh, we had the, the ice, and the, or what looked like ice, and three holes and illumination to pretend that it was actual sunlight coming back through. And the set was built to replicate one that was actually out on the ice. Come on. Oh, ah! When Joey dumps his hand through the, a hole in the ice, he, he drops a fish and it goes into back and through the hole. And then he, as an impulse, as if he has a chance of actually catching this fish, he goes up to his armpit into this hole. Well, I thought later, I thought, maybe that'd be a fun shot from underneath. Even though we did uh, the main shot on a set, so we ended up cutting a hole in the ice out in the middle of Houghton Lake. And uh, the Ross Common Sheriff's Department dive team went underwater in the in the freezing cold of Houghton Lake in the middle of winter under 18 inches of ice. And he held, we have an underwater camera, and he I kind of gave him a quick lesson on how to run this thing, and, and he operated the camera underwater. There's a scene in the uh, shanty where these, uh, these two goofball fishermen come in with one of those underwater fish viewing camera things and you dump a camera in the water and spin it around and you get to see what's going on. Oh, hey! Huh? Huh? That's old man Woodgate's old <laughs> snowmobile! You gotta be a classic uh. <laughs> Got this old snowmobile, it's probably a 35 year old uh, Evan route or something, and took the engine, uh, transmission, battery, gas tank, anything oily. We took the guts out of it basically, so it's nothing but a frame. 
it, we were really, really, truly running out of time. We went out there, it was freezing cold, it was windy as all get up. And the, there was a, I think it was a 10 foot rowboat and it's, a, it's an eight foot snowmobile. And it's hanging off the back end and we're paddling like, like madmen trying to get, get this thing out. And then we rigged up kind of a uh, burial at sea platform. And so we got into deep enough water, and I, I remember just kicking this thing out of the off this thing, and it fell into the lake and sank. The comedy's worth it. I think it's totally worth doing stuff like that because when you get into the spirit of this whole thing, the whole notion of a snowmobile that's underwater is already a little bit weird. Something, something obviously went wrong somewhere, and it, I think it speaks to the uh, the type of person that's out ice fishing anyway. He's used to he's used to having troubles like our characters in the movies are. And here's a perfect example of, of one of his forefathers that had the same problem 30 years before and, and just left the thing there. Oh, hey, there's my phone! Oh, I wonder if that thing still works! Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's amazing! <laughs> ah, holy crap! Ah! That sucker ate my phone! It was all done against a green screen. We came in like a Jim Henson puppet off here with this fish doing its little breathing and then looking and then wham, take off. Yeah, Holy crap, that's the great Kim, can you send Joey to set? The probe had to back up into the tailgate of this pickup truck just perfectly. It was hitting just a little off and we needed, to, we needed just a certain weight and so we had different people jump on the back of the probe to find out who was the right fit. Turns out Matt Kinney was the uh, uh, the right weight and temperament for this thing. I hope that when people go to see Frozen Stupid, that it's the hottest day in the summer you can possibly want and it'll make you feel cool. And that you like the picture, because believe me, we put a lot of uh, well-meant effort and heart and joy into it, and we hope that you like it. God bless you all. And I think it's gonna be fun to watch. It's, it's the kind of movie I love to make. <laughs>